It is great to be back home. I can't tell you what it feels like to be in my home church. Uh, I've been traveling over these last several months, and I was saying to someone this morning, I actually can't remember the last time I worshiped with you here, but it's great to be here. In my role as the executive minister for Converge Northeast, I have the opportunity to travel around the region. Our region is all of New England, part of New York State, and part of New Jersey. And we have about 110 congregations that I have the privilege of working with. And much of my activity is just this, as I get to go be with a worshiping congregation. Last week, I was in Bronxville, New York, uh, spending time with one of our congregations down there. And the week before, Valley Brook, just up the road in Granby. But as I work with our congregations, I want to tell you this. Just as we heard the story from David this morning of how God is working in his life, God is moving. He is moving across the Northeast. I don't know if you realize that, that there's a movement of God that we are seeing men and women, young, younger and older people, come to know Jesus Christ and be committed to the work. And I tell you this, we need more. We need more healthy churches. We need more healthy disciples because you may not realize this either. There are parts of the Northeast in this region that desperately need a gospel presence. And I say this to you this morning that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only answer for what ills us today. We need more churches, more disciples, people committed. And, and we have this opportunity to learn more of what is a disciple of Jesus Christ as we look into God's word this morning. This master class of discipleship. Because I would say this as well, that in our churches where I see health, I see active men and women, younger and older people, deeply committed in discipleship and following Jesus. And so let's look into God's word this morning. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the privilege we have of coming together in this place and opening your word together. Thank you, Father, that in the beginning of our, our time this morning that we've spent upward focused in our worship of you, that each of the songs we've shared together this morning is giving praise to you. And Father, in turn, when we do that, that opens us up to hear what it is you have to say to us. So Father, now, as we open your word, speak to us by your spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As I looked at this passage uh, in studying it, uh, typically, my practice is to read the passage over and over and over, kind of like the song we just sang. Uh, because when you do that, there are certain words, there are certain phrases, there are certain things that jump out at you as you, you read the Bible. And, and, and sometimes when a preacher prepares, there's a temptation to start researching, to start going to the internet, to looking at commentaries. But in this study, I really purpose to say, you know, I just want to read it, meditate on it, marinate on it, and let the, the word of God kind of wash over me as I was preparing. And certainly as I did that, certain words, certain phrases, in fact, two verses jumped out at me, and they were part of the overall context of this passage. But I want to just read those verses for you this morning. Because I think they are very instructive. They're really what I call a hinge point in this entire passage up to the point in Matthew chapter 6. And I'll read these verses for you. They're verses 22 and 23. The eye is a lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness... How great is that darkness? And I confess that, that I've read this, this whole passage many, many times, and we tend to focus up on laying up treasure in heaven. But these particular verses really jumped out at me. And, and so when that happens, you, you want to ask the question, why, why? God, Holy Spirit, what are you, what are you trying to teach me as, as those verses come out? Pause. When we think about the passage up to this point, 
Pastor Doug, a couple of weeks ago, taught about giving. And last week, Pastor Rob talked about praying. And this week, we're going to focus on fasting. These three things, these three practices, were, were pillars of Jewish piety. And really, in, in the context of this passage, it's, it's helpful to look at all three together. I won't do that today because we're going to focus on fasting. But one of the things I want to bring out to you is that often we think of those as, as outward practices. But really, they reflect an inward reality. Brandon was talking about the baptisms that are happening later today. That the, the, the act of being baptized is an outward expression of an inward reality of God working in our lives. Likewise, these three practices were, are really the same. And each of the, these three practices involve us giving up something. And certainly giving, we understand that in terms of giving our treasure, we're giving away money. And fasting, we, we give up food because the definition of fasting is that we simply abstain from food for a period of time. But the middle one, we also, of praying, we don't often think of giving up something, but actually we do. Because when we're praying, we are acknowledging that God is God and we are not. And so that involves us giving up something. And so an important point to understand is really our posture, our attitudes, our motivations. And that's why worship together as a body of Christ is so important. Because when we come together to worship, and I'll just confess, music is incredibly meaningful to me. I love music. I love singing. I love to worship. But more so, I love it because... It helps me understand who I am in juxtaposition of who God is. And the music we shared together was, was particularly apt because all of the songs we shared together were what I call upward focused. They're not me focused. They're not, you know, God give me, give me. But they were really acknowledging who God is. And that's an important aspect to understand when it comes to spiritual practices. And so as we, we look at these things, let's understand that. It's really about our posture, what the Holy Spirit is doing in us. Now, a funny story is I, maybe, maybe I thought about this, this idea of, of vision and sight because as I look across this room, I have to say probably many like me are visually challenged. Because if I take off my glasses, I really can't see very well. I mean, I, unfortunately, at this age, I need glasses for everything, near, medium, and far. And, and so it's a lot rather distressing when, uh, when my glasses break. In fact, uh, not so long ago when we had to wear masks, I took my mask off a little too quickly, and I ripped the arm of my glasses off. But I go back to my childhood. I started wearing glasses in third grade. My teacher, Mrs. Laughlin, in a little school in, in Sio, Ohio, a town of about 500 people, noticed that I, as I was sitting in the classroom, I was uh, squinting, and I couldn't see the blackboard. Some of you may have experienced that. And she finally sent a note home with me to my parents, Tim needs glasses. So since third grade, I have had to have my vision corrected. Now, another side note is my father was a dentist, and he got tired of, of fixing my glasses or, or my glasses breaking all the time. Sports and eyewear don't go well together, especially with a basketball. And so in dental work, Dad did everything, and he made dentures. And there's this pink material that he would use to make dentures. And he would actually then use that to fix my glasses. So rather than buying a new pair of glasses, I'd have this pink glob of stuff. <laughs> yeah, you get the picture. I tried to find a picture of that to show you, but I couldn't find one. And so, yeah, I would go to school with this pink glob of stuff. And the only time I would get a new pair of glasses when my vision changed. Sad part is that happened quite a bit. But the point, I say that's a funny story. But Jesus here is not talking about physical vision. 
He's talking about something else. But it's an, it's an important illustration as Jesus talks about the sight because that has more to do with what's going on inside of us. And so as we think about this, this really goes to our posture, our attitudes, our motivation, and I'll use an older word, our comportment, how we carry ourselves before God. And it starts with what I call an upward posture. Giving to the poor, praying and fasting, as I mentioned, were these three pillars of Jewish piety. And we learned that, that giving and praying were to be done in secret. And yet we see Jesus here really using quite sharp language when he, he calls out the practices of the day. And I'll just read and review what, what he said. In verse 1, it says this, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people. Unless we think that he's merely referring to those folks, right? We can often do that, those folks. Might we exhibit some of those same behaviors? That we, we practice our, our righteousness to be seen by others. Then, then he goes on, verse 2. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet. Now, can you imagine that, that before I give, there's, I'm sounding a trumpet? But that's what happened. Then, in terms of praying, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. And then in our passage today, Jesus, again, is pretty blunt. He says this, And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so that their fasting may be seen by others. As a reminder, fasting is simply abstention from food for a period of time. And there were different types of fasts practiced privately and corporately for different occasions and religious festivals. Old Testament law, however, only required one. It was on the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur. But over time, the number of fasts multiplied, uh, so much so that at the point of Jesus' time, there were, were groups of people that actually did a full fast at least twice a week, on, typically on, on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So they became part of daily religious life together. And as Jesus describes in this passage, there were some that would even go so far to, to tear their clothes, to make them look all disheveled and, 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 and gaunt in their appearance so that it would tell the world, I'm fasting. See? And that's what Jesus was so upset about. This was a trap that, that, that the religious leaders were elevating their religious status in the eyes of the people. And in effect, they were, they were basking in the praise and adulation of the people. Question. Is this an appropriate posture? And remember, the, the context of the, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is teaching a new way. He is, he is teaching what a true disciple is to be, countercultural to the teaching that folks were receiving in that day. The proper practice of spiritual disciplines is a matter of the heart. How do we make sure that we're checking our attitudes, our motivations, our posture as we practice the spiritual disciplines? And fasting is a way to demonstrate humility and a right posture before God. And fasting has to do with self-denial, certainly. And again, a way to humble ourselves before God and, and open ourselves up to what he has to say to us. Psalm 35, 13 says, Yet, when they were ill, I put on sackcloth and humbled myself with fasting. Psalm, or Isaiah 53, 3 why have we fasted, they say, and have you not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? The religious leaders of the day so structured and so ritualized 
the practice of fasting, that its purpose and intent were lost. And in fact, they were taking a posture opposite of humility. And, and they really made it a theatrical performance. And in effect, they were putting on makeup like a show. Again, to receive the praise and adulation from the people. Scripture is the best way to interpret Scripture. And I want to share a story with you from Luke chapter 18 that gives us another picture of appropriate posture before the Lord. And I'll just read this for you. Luke 18, verses 10 through 14. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus continues, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And as we reflect back on the quote-unquote prayer of the Pharisee, I think we can all agree that wasn't a prayer. He presumed to boast of his good deeds before God. And so who demonstrated the po proper posture? And I think we can agree that the tax collector did. But again, might we also, I won't point the finger, you'll point it at me, are there times when I demonstrate the posture or the comportment of the Pharisee? Or I presume to tell of my good deeds and actions to God? He knows my heart. He knows your heart. And we see the, the, the tax collector simply acknowledge that he was a sinner before God. When we demonstrate the proper posture and attitude toward God for his majesty, his goodness, his mercy, his salvation, you can keep going of the many, many things that God does for us. This then leads towards the inner transformation because we're acknowledging that he is God and we're not. We're acknowledging that he is holy and we are not. We're acknowledging that he is righteous and we, we are not. And the Holy Spirit begins that work within us of transformation. So let's go back to the illustration of the eye. The eye is a lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. One commentator stated, when the eye is focused on something of value, it becomes the conduit that fills the heart with what has been focused upon. And if the eye is good, it is the conduit that allows the heart to be filled with the light of God's treasure. Pastor and theologian John Stott says, if we have physical vision, we can see what we are doing and where we are going, right? So too, if we have spiritual vision, if our spiritual perspective is correctly adjusted, then our life is filled with purpose of drive. Conversely, if our eyes are fixed on earthly treasure to provide us value, significance, and security, the heart will be full of darkness. We can lose our healthy spiritual vision when we focus on the wrong things and the wrong practices. Interestingly, when Jesus talks about giving, praying, and fasting, there's a very important word that he uses. 
when, not if. And I confess that, that particularly fasting is one of those areas that, let's put it this way, in my performance review, I could use a needs improvement. And so as we consider these things, these practices that Jesus is teaching on, how would you give yourself a self-appraisal? How would you rank yourself? And I don't bring that up to make us feel guilty, but allow the Holy Spirit to speak and to work in you, to cause you to say, God, how might I draw closer to you in these practices? Again, when, not if. Jesus is taking these practices further. Fasting was not to be done in the public manner of the Pharisees. It was to be done in secret as a heart matter between God and us. And this is one example to show how the true discipleship Jesus is talking about far surpasses the legalistic, the, the, the outwardly pious practices of the Pharisees. When our inner being is transformed, it is then we are motivated to practice spiritual disciplines, which can then have an outward impact. Transformation brings about the motivation to focus on the right things and the right treasure. So this brings to me my third point of outward action. Our upward posture brings about inward transformation that only God can do. But then this is translated into our outward actions. Jesus' teaching on giving, praying, and fasting leads directly to his treasure, or his teaching on treasure. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. There is a view at this time that, that material wealth was a sign of God's favor and blessing. And there are teachings today that indicate that as well. And so there, this is problematic when we think about that it's an automatic. If I do these things, then I'm automatically going to be materially wealthy. And certainly we, we know this is health and wealth gospel teaching, which is false. But again, where this view gets shattered is that we all know that there are people that acquire material treasure through illegal means. So that can't be the answer either. So what is Jesus talking about here? He's clearly differentiating between earthly treasure and heavenly treasure. He's saying that, that the earthly stuff can be destroyed. It goes away. It's temporary. But the heavenly treasure remains. It's eternal. And his point is that when we practice these things, giving to the poor, praying, and fasting, we are, in effect, laying up eternal treasure in heaven. Now, he's not teaching that material wealth is evil. That's not the point. But he is teaching that to put our hope, our trust, our values, our self-esteem, basically, we're putting our full whatever into earthly things, that is wrong. And that is false. Treasure in this context is more than money. It can represent anything that takes our eyes off Jesus Christ. Many, 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 many years ago, I was a competitive runner. I still love to run, not as much as I used to. But somehow, I still continue to acquire running shoes. Sharon can share with you how many, but I seem to have probably a few more than are, are necessary. But seriously, might that be an example of earthly treasure? 
And I want you to think about in your own life, what are those things that, that are quote unquote important to you that take your, your time, your energy, your focus, or you're placing your value, could be even your career, could be in relationships, but they're things that draw your attention fully away from our Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, back to our illustration of the eye. A good eye can mean a generous eye, or it can mean a person who demonstrates, I love this, undivided loyalty. Conversely, an evil eye, or in my people's language in Italy, malocchio, mal meaning bad, occhio meaning eye. And in cultures of that day, the evil eye was very present. But the evil eye is, uh, can be moral evil, or it can mean a person who demonstrates, excuse me, a person who enviously covets what belongs to others. What we value is driven by what's in here. Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. If we keep our hearts focused on the Father, all other treasures will not be able to compare. It will align our priorities, our motives, our actions, our obligations, our security, our self-worth, our relationships. Keep filling in the blank. What Jesus is talking about here is the entirety of our being, this word devotion, there's a depth to that. And fasting is one of the ways that we lay up treasure in heaven. It's a way that, that sharpens our focus. When, when we go without food, there's this there's a physiological thing that's going on, but there's a sharpening of the mind. There's a sharpening of, of our focus. And again, we, the, the tendency is that like, oh, I, I'm not having food here. I don't like that. But the way we refocus is to, to focus on scripture, to focus on prayer, to focus on what God is doing. It helps us focus on advancing the gospel, on heaven, on the spiritual realm, on the kingdom of God. And Jesus finishes up this teaching by this focus on that, saying that no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. This is a hard teaching. And I confess that, that, that probably with you, I need to examine myself. We need to examine ourselves. How do we, how do we stack up to what, what Jesus is asking us to do? So what is our upward posture? What is our upward posture that brings about the inward transformation that the Spirit does in our lives that results in truly God-honoring outward Actions. Where's your stuff? Where's your focus? What's got your attention? Where are you putting your, your energy? What is taking the best of who you are? Are you focusing your best on what God wants? Or are you focusing on what you or others want? That's our challenge today. So that in our practice of spiritual disciplines, we must do so with the right attitudes, posture, and motivation. And in the school, this master class of discipleship, we practice fasting to rightly focus our attention on God, and in doing so, we align our behavior to become more like Jesus Christ.